unfortunately for us, we do have Lauren who very, very kindly um, on Tuesday said that she'll step up to the plate and do a second presentation. So uh, we love all our presenters, but I think Lauren did an extra big cheer. So welcome on stage, Lauren. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so, so hi everyone, I'm Lauren Scher. I am a face and PEM, so pediatric emergency physician. I'm based at the Northern Hospital. And um, my only disclaimer is I recently put in a video and if it doesn't work, we will have that awkward moment where we just move on to the next slide. So to set the scene for pediatric emergency, hopefully this works. Nope, it doesn't work. We will just uh, see if we've got a minor tech issue. Can we play it? And off we go to the next slide. So, why do a pain talk? So, for those of you who don't know, the Northern Hospital is the third busiest emergency department in the country. It's a very interesting place to work. We have over 60 different languages represented. We're multicultural. It's a bit like the Wild West, except we're in the north of Victoria. And I originally started there back in 2012 as the Director of Pediatric Emergency. And during the very first few weeks of my um, my job there. The one day I was called to triage and somebody said to me, hey, this is Rosie, she's 12 years old, her ankle looks a bit mangled, do you mind writing up some Panadol for her and we'll send her around to the peas pod. And I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty interesting because Rosie looks like she might need a bit more than Panadol. And at the same time, an ambo came in with an adult with quite a similar injury, screaming his head off and he was being wheeled off to resus as a cat too. So I realised that one of my first jobs was to really try and address the issues around pain management in paediatrics. And I'm hoping that today I can at least teach you a couple of tips and tricks about why pain is different in children, how to address it, and um, how to manage it more appropriately. So the aims of this talk is to identify paediatric pain, assess and address pain early, and really start thinking about pain management more as a plan rather than just a single moment in time. And just to remember that pain is condition specific, it's adjusted for age when we manage it, and we also have a lot of non-pharmacological tools up our sleeve that we can use. So what are some of the challenges we have when we think about paediatric pain? So when I started, to give you an example, um, my paediatric training, I started in NICU. When I did NICU, we didn't believe pa babies had pain. Yeah? We would intubate without sedation, we would do arterial stabs without any analgesia. Babies would just lie there and we would just assume that a cry was okay, and it was all okay, they weren't going to remember anyway. But there's lots of really good literature that shows that all these little traumatic, traumatic interventions and painful interventions do actually have long-term consequences. And just because a child cannot verbalize, I'm in pain, doesn't mean that they don't have it. So one of the most important things I always teach my registrars is that children regress. And those of you who are parents in the room will, will, have, will um, have testimonials for that. So put them in a stressful situation and your chatty 12-year-old suddenly becomes a quiet little six-year-old. Your 17-year-old suddenly behaves like a toddler. We all know these situations. So they, they really do not behave age appropriately under stressful situations. So you bring them into a hospital, you've got them maybe on an ambo trolley, they've got foreign people around them, they're not gonna behave like you would typically expect a pediatric patient to behave. One of the biggest misconceptions, which I always tell my triage staff, is that the quiet child is actually the child in the most amount of pain, not the screaming child. So I want you all to do a little, a little experiment for me. I want you to all pretend you've got a very broken arm and hold it up against your body, because that's what most children with broken arms do. They splint it, don't they? And now I want you to pretend you were screaming, or just take a deep breath in, and tell me what happens to your arm when you take a big deep breath in. That arm moves, yeah? So kids learn really quickly that if you scream and shout and you're splinting your arm up against your chest, that's going to increase your pain. Similarly, the kid with appendicitis versus the kid screaming with constipation. The kid with appendicitis is really quiet and still doesn't move. They learn really quickly that minor movement is going to exacerbate their peritonism. The kid with colicky, crampy, I haven't gone to the toilet in a few days pain, they're the kid writhing around and making a whole bunch of noise. They're not peritonitic. So rem always remember this, the quiet, pale, withdrawn child is in way more pain than the child that's kicking and screaming off. And don't underestimate the value of parents. We say this all the time. 
And you know we all roll our eyes because the parents come in and they go, my child is so resilient, they have a high pain threshold and we all have that moment of eye roll, yeah? But actually they, do, they are their best advocate for the child. They do know their child best. So if they say their child's in pain, their, their child probably is in pain. So there's a couple of different tools we use um, to try and address pain in the non-verbal child. And just remember this might be a child with cerebral palsy. So it's not necessarily your child that's, you know, just a baby or an infant. It might be your non-verbal child with delayed developmental milestones. We might use something like the FLAC scale. It's really important to understand that when you do something like the FLAC scale, it's, it's only helpful if you do it again, post an intervention, yeah? So you want to see that that child's actually improving. It's no point documenting it once because your nurse manager told you that that's what has to be done for every child and they're never doing it again. What you want to see is that you've done an intervention based on the score and that that score continues to improve. These are my registrars about 10 years ago. They're all consultants now, which is a testament to my age. Um, Really what we're trying to indicate here is that the one baker faces are often used particularly for verbal children. So you really want sort of a cooperative. You might get like a really clever five, six-year-old who could probably do this. Usually from seven years old, they're pretty good at doing this. And uh, zero being one, ten being the worst. They're actually um, culturally appropriate. So if you go to different countries, the one baker faces look quite different. Again, it's a single intervention in time, yeah? So if a child's scoring their pain as ten and you give them something, you want to see that that pain score is coming down. This has not been published. I call this adolescent scoring scale. <laughs> if the child has no phone in their hand, they have peri-arrest. Please get ready to start CPR. <laughs> okay, so what is a, plain, a pain plan and why is it important? Because often we think about controlling the pain now, but if you don't actually think about what's going to happen in that child's journey, you're doing them a disservice. So, for example, it's all good and well giving them some intranasal fentanyl, but in half an hour when they're off to x-ray, that fentanyl's wearing off while the radiographer's playing with their arm. So you really want to be thinking about getting a lot of analgesia in at the beginning to get the short-acting stuff in that's really potent and that's going to act quickly, but you also want to get the long-acting stuff. And we really undervalue the, the benefits of giving things like regular Panadol and Nurofen just to get a baseline pain control. All right? And for those of us working in hospital, it's also then to, it's good to think about what's going to happen during this child's admission. You know, what, what can I write up on this child's drug chart when they go to the ward that's going to keep them comfortable until one of the regs goes up and sees them on the ward? I also want to think about some of the non-pharmacological tools. Yeah, so nothing distresses me more than when a registrar starts their term in pediatrics and they keep trying to move the child away from the parent. Nothing distresses a child more and makes scoring pain or any sort of uh, medical assessment more difficult than removing a child from the parent. So remember to use your parents, remove distractions. I don't know how we did pediatric emergency before iPhones and iPads. It has really been a game changer. So pull out the phones, pull out teddy bears, pull out, pull out the shark song if you have to. Um, but remember to use everything possible. You don't always have to um, just hit heavy on the pharmacological agents. So I thought we'd run this as a bit of a quiz. Really, I guess, just to sort of emphasize the fact that we all do things a little bit differently and there is no right way to manage pain. We all have our little tips and tricks. So I'm just going to throw it out there. We've got a four-year-old. This is pretty common. I see one of these on every shift. I saw a couple on uh, Christmas. Um, isolated injury. They're really quiet and they're really hesitant. Do you think it's painful? Yes or no? Yes, okay, so what are we going to do for this kid? What's going to help this kid's pain? I don't have lollies to throw out, and it's probably a health hazard anyway. Any thoughts? Pre-hospital, what do we want to do? Yeah, fentanyl, intranasal fentanyl, great. Anything else? Splint, yes, fantastic. So we want to splint it. Most kids won't tolerate ice on a broken arm, but if you can get it on there, great. We want to elevate it. We want to do all the basic stuff. We want to get some intranasal fentanyl. Do you want to give them some Panadol on the truck? Yeah, that's really helpful for us because, again, as I said, you can start those long-term acting agents. It's not going to affect my ability to do a sedation, and it's not going to affect the ability to take this kid to theatre if you're giving oral Panadol and Nurofen. The anaesthetist don't consider that as not busted. So you can absolutely give some oral agents. Alrighty, so they arrive at hospital. What do we want to do next in the emergency department? Any thoughts? Any 
Any in-hospital emergency doctors in the room? Yeah, great. So we want to get some Emla on. Excellent. The kid arrives, we want to get some Emla on. What else? Preferably on the other hand, be helpful. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could give some oxycodone now. You probably get some Nurofen in. But fundamentally, you want to get this straight, yeah? Because that's what's going to help this child. So it, it might be neurovascular intact still, but for neurovascular purposes and also predominantly for pain, this child's journey is going to end with at least straightening it. And even if the x-rays come back, and I'm confident it's not going to be a definitive, um, you know, definitive ED procedure, they probably may still need to go to theatre, I would still pull this straight. Because if they sit on the ward for hours on ending, you know how they keep getting bumps from theatre, it's going to be really painful even if it's splinted in that position. So I would pull to straightness just for pain control in this situation and then continue to elevate. But yeah, getting on some Panadol, Neurofen, some Oxycodone from the ward is a really great idea. Alrighty, this one. So this is old Johnny who jumped off a trampoline and missed and came down on concrete, has come in again, isolated injury, stable but inconsolable. He's on the ambulance trolley. He's sitting on mum's lap. What do we, what do we want to do for him? A regional block? Yeah. Fantastic. How many of you try to do a regional block in a three-year-old? <laughs> and first question, how are you going to get him off the trolley? But I like the way you're thinking. You're going to try splint it, okay? Yeah, you could, and sometimes that works. So sometimes a good dose of intranasal fentanyl will help you transport uh, the child. In this case, uh, that wasn't helpful. We couldn't get the kid off. Every time we tried to move, they just screamed. The bone was moving. We could feel that this was really unstable. So what we actually did was we actually gave this child ketamine on the trolley outside of recess, and as soon as they were under, we gave them IM ketamine, transported them straight onto the bed and got them hooked up onto monitoring. That's really helpful because now you mentioned a regional block. Much easier to do a regional block in a child that's sedated and not screaming at you, yeah? So you can get good control of the situation, pop in an IV, you don't have to wait for the emla to cook because the child's sedated. And you can do a couple of other things. So what I like to really do for these children, because I know that, does anyone know what the definitive management is usually for these kids? Not hip spiker, they're going to traction. Yeah, so they're going to traction, which is really, really painful. So what we like to do is get in the, the regional anesthesia, and if they're still under, I can get them a little, little tiny aliquot of ketamine and actually get the ward bed down. Transport them while they're still under ketamine onto the bed, get them onto traction, and when they wake up, the parents think you're fantastic. They've got their regional block in. They've had maybe some intravenous medications. Maybe they've had some IV Panadol, and uh, that child's a lot more comfortable. So just, again, thinking about what's going to get the situation under control now, but actually facilitate you getting long-term control during that child's ED stay, but then also help facilitate getting that child to the ward in a comfortable manner, because there's nothing worse than waking this child up and then suddenly realising they're on the, on the wrong bed. So now they're on the wrong bed. Now you've got to move them onto another bed, and now you're going to try to get them into traction. Much easier to just plan this all in advance and prepare your procedure. So this is one that often gets um, mistreated or, or mismanaged from a pain perspective. Anyone know what the diagnosis is? Eight-month-old with intermittent colicky abdo pain. Yeah, good. From what? Thank you. So we have intersusception. Do we think intersusception is painful? Yes. Yeah, so it's equivalent to ischemic. Yeah, to getting ischemic gout. Yeah. So. I always say to people, think about what you would want done if you were 50 years old and you had your first bowel obstruction. You'd probably want something quite similar for your, for your, uh, for your, for this baby. So now there's a couple of challenges though, because they're under 12 months of age. Yeah, so we we're a little bit nervous about giving things like intranasal fentanyl to the eight-month-old. So who wants to throw out what we might want to do for this kid's pain, for this baby's pain? Pretend it's not there and walk away, pick up the next patient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Anyone? Okay, so this one, we, th these children can actually um, go into shock, so you're going to put in an IV anyway. So this is the baby you're going to give small little doses of IV morphine to, just to try to get their pain under control. You can also give them some IV paracetamol. 
um, weight, weight appropriate. And that generally helps to get them really good pain relief. Um, but again, I always find the under 12 months, people are really scared to give out things like IV morphine, but you wouldn't leave the 50 year old with bowel obstruction with no analgesia. So we really shouldn't leave the under 12 month old without pain relief. Painful or not painful, again, I probably see one or two of these a shift. It's a typical <coughs> mom says, I just turned my back for a call, you know, for five seconds and they tip their teacup over, over themselves. Uh, do we think this is painful? Yeah, it's a pre-hospital, what are we gonna do? Thank you for how long? Yes, fantastic. So the, the literature shows that if you run it under water for 20 minutes, it's not only gonna have um, good pain relief instantly, but actually a prognostic implication for that child's burn. So within three hours, the 20 minutes of water means that that depth of burn is gonna be hopefully reduced. So it's really important to get the 20 minutes on. What's gonna be the next thing you wanna think about? Yeah, so I actually find often giving the intranasal fentanyl helps to get the 20 minutes of water um, going. So, the, so we often, if they come into the emergency department, we give them intranasal fentanyl and send them into the showers to get their 20 minutes. And we often find that's quite helpful. I'm not quite sure that would work well in pre-hospital, but um, that's just a nice little trip, uh, trick for the emergency department. And we often just get them some Panadol and Nurofen. The next thing we want to do is get this covered because it's actually the exposure of the, the skin or lack of skin that's really, really painful. So any, does anyone know what we often cover them in? Glad yeah, glad wrap. So it really does depend where you are. So if you're working at the children's hospital, you just go straight to the, the fancy dressings first time. But because I work at the Northern and we're gonna to have to transport this down, we're gonna, we're gonna use the Glad Wrap. Now it's not like the, the sandwiches down in the, in the Rizutsu Cafe. Um, you might cause a bit of ischemia if you do too much Glad Wrapping. So we actually cut, cut them into strips and we almost uh, put it together like a puzzle using some, some tape, trying to put tape only on the areas that are not burnt. And that often actually really helps to settle, settle the pain. The reason we don't put the dressings on here is because often we send them down the road and for some reason they don't trust our dressings, so then they take our dressings off and they replace them. And that's really painful for the children. Um, it's also the other reason we don't use burn shield, particularly in Melbourne on these kids, for the same reason the gel gets quite adhesive to them and we often have to scrub it off to get the acticoat on and so we, we prefer not to use um, any of the fancy gels, we just like water. So to finish off, 16 year old male with zipper injury. Okay, so my registrar at the time said, pain rating must be 10, anesthetize him and take him to theatre. <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly not what we're going to do in this situation. Um, any thoughts about what you might want to do? Panadol and Nurofen. Panadol and Nurofen. You are not a very generous man. <laughs> All right, anything else? Yeah, absolutely. So you want to get some good, decent analgesia into this kid. So intranasal fentanyl, some IV morphine is great. I always like to end this pain talk with a, a little bit of a discussion about conversations with children. So when I was working in the UK with children, I was a very baby junior registrar. I was working one night and a little four-year-old came in with a zipper injury. And um, his mum had bought him a new pair of jeans and it was his very, very first pair of jeans. And he was super, super excited. And so what had happened was mum had put him to bed in his pyjamas, but he'd crept out of bed, gone and put on his new pair of jeans and given himself a zipper injury. So this was fine, like we knew how to sort it out and I explained to the parents, you know, we're just gonna cut around the zip and then the zip comes apart, it's all really easy, it's a very simple procedure, it's not painful from the perspective of we're not gonna have to do surgery or anything, but we'll give him some pain relief. What I hadn't acknowledged at that time is that it was probably important to tell the child what I was going to do. Because I walked in with this big pair of trauma <laughs> scissors and this little boy turned around to me and said to me, please don't cut off my willy, I'll never do that again. <laughs> so I guess as part of this talk, one of the things that we underestimate in our conversations about pain and management of pain is actually conversations with children. We're very good at explaining to parents what we're gonna do and what we're gonna give, but we sometimes forget to engage the child and they're verbal and they're, they're, they're hearing everything we're saying and they're lying there terrified, passively absorbing. So just remember as part of pain management, really important to, to speak to children if they're verbal and receptive.
So in summary of this talk, I hope I've given you a quick brief insight into management of paediatric pain. Um, remember, paediatric pain does present differently for all various reasons we've discussed. It's really important to assess and address pain early and to please think of it as a pain management journey, not just a single moment in time. Try and plan for the next step. It's really helpful for the next clinician that's taking over that patient's care.